So I called them right back and said, I need to see you again, there's something wrong. They just, again, said, it's probably nothing, but let's do the CT. That's how I found out I had cancer. My name is Vicki D. Before cancer, I was um, very high functioning as in trying to cram as many things as I could into a day and almost aggressively um, staying busy. I'm outdoorsy. I, um, people call, you know, tomboy is what they would call me. I love the water. I swim, paddleboard, kayak, uh, bicycle, travel, um, garden. I have some chickens that are pretty much fun to have in the city. So I live in the middle of Austin, Texas, and I have um, lived here most of my life. And I was diagnosed in the fall, well, yeah, the fall of 2020. So I was 66 years old and my symptoms were that I didn't feel well and had some pain. I believe that the pain was intermittent enough <laughs> that it was reoccurring. It wasn't every single day, but it was enough. But unfortunately, it was from May until September because I went to see a gynecologist and she wasn't real interested in an old woman that was having a little pain. How did the gynecologist respond to you um, when you went to her and said, I have these symptoms and you just mentioned that she says she wasn't that interested, but how did she specifically respond to you? She just responded by saying that all of my tests had always been fine. I hadn't had any um, abnormal um, test results over the years. Um, unfortunately, because I was 66, I had seen many gynecologists over the years from first having my children. And so her, her reply to me when I said, there is something wrong, this pain isn't going away. And I don't believe it's a bladder infection, UTI. I've only had one in my life and there's no blood. And she said, we'll go ahead and run that test again. Make sure it's not a UTI. So they did, they ran the test again, called me up, you do not have a UTI. That wasn't a good answer for me because I knew if it's not that, then what is it? And ironically, the next, uh, next day after my exam, I started seeing blood. So I called them right back and said, I need to see you again, there's something wrong. So they had me see the assistant, the PA, and she also said, you do not have a UTI. And I said, then let me see someone else. Who can I go see? And they recommended a urogynecologist. That was another pause to get in to see. I called my friends and no one had a urologist in their phone book and their little contact. So my next step was to rely on this doctor. And I literally had to call three times to get the name of someone and then the referral. And luckily the referral was a gyno urologist and she was the one who said, I don't think there's anything the matter here, but just in case, you know, we're going to take some measurements or whatever. Secondly, we're going to go ahead and do a CT scan. And we're also going to do a cystoscopy. And as I'm freaking out there on the table, what do you mean? Why do we need a CT scan? Doesn't that mean cancer? And that's when she said, oh, you, there's no chance of you having cancer. That's an old man smoker's disease. 
Um, you did, I did smoke in my thirties for a short while, but I hadn't smoked then for 30 something years. Um, they just, again, said it's probably nothing, but let's do the CT. That's how I found out I had cancer. And the CT scan, I could tell, it sounds weird, but the people that were running the test, the CT machine, the scanner, I could tell they were like, no, why are you here? Okay. And it was, it was daunting. And because it's COVID, I have no one with me. Everything that I did, I'm completely by myself because no one was allowed into any rooms with me. So I'd have my phone with me and do a conference call. And then I was on a little trip and the urogynecologist called me up and said, I have some bad news. And that's how she said it. I can't help you. I need to refer you to another doctor. And I said, okay, I have a tumor in my bladder and it's how big. And she told me it was about two and a half centimeters. And I said, great, that's the size of my thumb. I used to teach science, so I know centimeters. And I said, oh, that's not good. Okay. So that doctor wasn't available, they said, for two weeks. So now we're again, it's now fall. It's now end of October. And I pushed that appointment up. I said, no, 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 no. I need to see this doctor. What's his next available? Work me in. And then he told me when I saw his card first, that was daunting to see his business card saying that he was not just a urologist, he was a uro oncologist. And then I went, I have cancer because I'm thinking tumor like you, it's a tumor. They get rid of a tumor. I've had a benign tumor removed from my breast. I thought, okay, everything was fine. And he said, no, let me show you your scan. <laughs> and I saw the tumor on the bladder wall and went, okay, what does this mean? He said, it means, yes, we're going to do the cystoscopy. We're going to try to remove it, but it looks like it's on the wall. And if it's in the muscle, there's nothing that we can do but remove the bladder. And I, I lost, I mean, I was by myself. I was on that table. I'm just going, please don't tell me this. I don't know what that means for my life because I am super active. And I don't want to stop. I like to keep moving. In fact, to sit here doing this is very difficult. Because I'm always, when the sun is shining, I'm outside. I took his information. I said, what about a second opinion? He goes, well, before we get there, I want to do the cystoscopy. And he was putting me out two more weeks. And I said, nope, I need you to schedule me your next time you're doing this procedure. Please work me in. I beg you. So we pushed the cystoscopy to two days later. Yeah, he came out and said, can't do anything for you but chemo and remove the bladder. Yeah, I needed at that moment a person so that I could find out is this reality? Because as you know, I, uh, anyone that's ever had this kind of news, it's hard at that moment to say, is this really happening? Because just like you, I have tried to eat right, stay fit, do everything to be healthy. And I always thought it would be a heart attack or a stroke. I had no idea it would be a tumor that I would have to face then getting chemo, which also kills you. As you know, you die, you come back. Um, so yeah, I felt very alone when they did the cystoscopy and Mitch did get to sit in the waiting room there. They did allow that. And when Dr. Laviana told both of us all this horrible news, I was glad that he was with me I needed someone else to hear what he was saying. From that moment on, I realized I needed to always have my phone on me so that it could be a conference call if need be, three-way, four-way, because I wanted, after I told my daughters then a couple you know, days later, which was really hard, I wanted my daughters to hear whatever the doctor was saying. I wanted Mitch to hear whatever they were saying. And I wanted my sister who has been in medicine. She's not a doctor or a nurse, but she's been in the field. I wanted her to hear it. I needed this support group to hear it. So it wasn't me trying to jot down every single fact and have that support. Yeah. You were jotting down furiously what the doctor is telling you, but you're how are you feeling? Because at the same time, you're also feeling, I don't know, I imagine, I know what I felt like, but shock, uh, like you have this whole cycle of uh, different emotions. 
while you're trying to left brain um, the diagnosis. So tell me what that was like for you. I just told myself, yes, this is my new job. My new job is Vicky's body. And clearly it wasn't a good business. I just hung in there. I don't know how else to describe it. I didn't cry until I think chemo, I think once chemo hit, then I started feeling sad because the changes were taking place and I didn't care for the way I felt physically. I didn't have the energy that I always have. I couldn't even walk a block down the street and I'm used to walking five miles and hiking and yes. So that's when I think I was the saddest was the chemo. Doctor that you saw here at, uh, at Dell, the oncologist, urologist, how did he present to you what your treatment options were? And how did you feel when he heard, told you that? As I remember, he said, just very quickly, there's a couple schools of thought about the chemo regimen. Some people even do radiation. Um, so his his idea was, we've got UT Dell Oncology here. You know, he didn't even mention Texas Oncology. He just started automatically just saying, you know, all of this is right here at this facility. And I remember this notebook that I had, and I wrote down the, the two kinds of chemo regimens versus radiation. Um, and I said, how do you feel about me going to MDA? Because I'm going. <laughs> and he's like, of course, always get a second opinion. I said, good. Because I always told my clients, you should always get a couple of bids. Don't just go with me, please go get those bids. So that's what I felt like. Okay. I'm going to go get a couple more bids and see what these doctors say. And I reached out to some of my friends. I got in to see Dr. Kamat and all of that, those teams of people there. I mean, it's daunting, but it's amazing that the expertise, um, even though I think my doctor is an expert and I'm really glad I have him in Austin I knew I had these folks and that they were going to maybe not cure me, but I was in excellent hands. I was always going to have the neobladder. I just thought that's the only way I can do this. I have to have something that's not external. I'm so active. I don't want this extra piece of equipment. So you mentioned the neobladder. Did the doctor present that as an option or... How was that handled? As soon as he told me about the neobladder, I was like right on it. Then Dr. Kamat and his group and the oncologist there, Dr. Campbell, they're looking at me going, hmm, are you sure you want the neobladder because you're super active? It takes about a year to ever even figure out how to avoid having these accidents, you'll be wearing a diaper for at least six months and maybe longer. You will catheterize yourself daily. And just the thought of that, I'd had the catheters now, right? When I had my children and then this time I was like, I am done with catheters. I can't do that. No, I'm not catheterizing. Okay. So the neobladder then became this, oh, I'm not going to do it. But up until the day of surgery, Dr. Laviana thought I was going to do it. Yes. He said, oh, neobladder. I said, no, I'm not doing it too much. And uh, so talk to me about uh, chemo and what you ended up doing, how long you were in. Did you, was it overnight? Did you go every day, every week? Or what was that like? And how did you feel about it? Um, again, I was really glad about modern science because I know that a couple of years ago and at MDA, they still do this you are in the hospital when you receive your chemo treatments. And the one that I wanted was the uh, DDM back, which is the heavy dense dose. Um, you go in one day and they give you two of the drugs and then you go in the second day and they give you the rest of them. But I wanted to get rid of this tumor and say, I'm done with this. And they said the best way to do it is to use this heavy dense dose. It was COVID again, so no one could go into Texas oncology with me. I would just sit there and freeze. It was so cold. Um, and that, I think, 
was the most frightening part of the six besides the surgery. Definitely. I mean, MDA was daunting and frightening and all the tests being done there by myself, but going in to Texas oncology by myself, walking up those steps and seeing all the patients, it was very, very, very hard. I'm curious how you felt at the end of the first one and then the second one. That first treatment, I went, well, that's not too bad. But then I saw that I was going to take seven other pills. Again, modern science, amazing stuff. Because in the hospital, they're going to give it to you IV. But at home, the second you get home, basically, you start taking these pills. And you do that every other week, right? She said, you've got to take it because it's going, it was a steroid, I believe. It's going to help your immune system. You're going to feel weird. And she told me how I would feel. And she was exactly right. I became more ADD than I am. Um, I couldn't focus, you know, but, oh, well, I was in the chemo (laughs) regimen. So I just said, this is what I have to do. And another modern medicine that I just have to be grateful for is the anti-nausea because I was so sick. I couldn't stand food. It just made me, you know, just looking at it. It's always that second, third, third day, third day was down. Oh my gosh. Did you ever have the mouth sore? Did you ever? Oh, yeah. It was horrible. It was just like my, your, uh, my um, oncologist told me, Dr. Yorio said, he said, they're ulcers, Vicki, they're sores. And if you don't treat them, you know, you can get infections. And so, of course, I did the baking soda salt. They had something else to it, milk of magnesia. That's it. They throw all this stuff together and you're supposed to swish it and swallow it because your stomach also has a sores. But my best friend was Mexican Coca-Cola. And I guess it reacted with those sores because I, you know, it didn't hurt to drink it. Whereas just water would kill my mouth. So... Did, in fact, your hair start to fall out day 14, which is what they, and what was that like? What what did it feel like physically? What did you notice? And how did you feel emotionally about it? Well, I was very lucky that my daughters, I had long, long hair and I put them in braids one day. We picked the day. They came over. We, They each took, you know, a braid. They cut it off. And... Then one of my daughters kind of styled my hair like it is now. Then finally, I just said, Mitch, give me your bro- your buzzer because he has one of those little hair buzzers. I said, I'm buzzing it. I can't take it. I don't want to see these hairs on the floor. I don't want to see them on my body. And so I buzzed it. He buzzed it. And then I just started wearing scarves all the time and hats. So I don't have many photos without a hat or a scarf on. This is fun now. It's fun to, I think I'm going to just sort of stay with this because I think I'm so different myself that I don't really want to have that look that I had. I know that sounds weird, but I'm from a generation where we grew our hair and never cut it. You know, we just grew it. I've had hair down to my rear end, but you know, I just go, eh, I'm different now. My identity of being the strongest person in the room, (laughs) like I am strong, I can do anything, was not that anymore. And I felt like, how can I guide anybody? Like people come to me for information and guidance. And I thought, I guess I'm not that person anymore, but I'm kind of getting it back. So exactly six weeks after my surgery, when I could start exercising again, I was out there doing everything I could to get my strength, my physical strength back. And I think also just getting older is scary because I don't have the balance I used to have. I think I practiced yoga for over 20 years and I had the best balance around. And now it's sort of like, oh, I could fall over. Um, But I think that identity that you're asking about When people say they fought cancer, that's great. I don't think I fought cancer. I'm more, I just, I wanted to rid it. I wanted it gone. I wanted to not have that 
oh yeah, well, Vicki, she does that because she had cancer, you know, or she has cancer or whatever. I didn't want that to be my identity. I wanted it to be more of, okay, everybody, I'm here. I'm who I used to be. I may look different because I have to tell myself that because I'm not, I'm not the same. No. Well, that's really interesting um, because you are, you, you have presence and I can tell how you'd be an instant um, leader and encourager of other people. So what's different about you now? I think my personality was always, I'm going to live my life, but I have to get all these other things done. There's so many, I, know, I really have to get you know all this laundry done or whatever it is. I'm a little less, oh, got to get going, get in the car and go. I'll sit and I'll just sort of look outside and I don't meditate, but I do try to hear those birds singing or uh, the squirrels running around on my roof, whatever. I'm, I'm going into everything a little less um, hurried and I am trying not to be as negative as I used to be. It's the word now to me is better than saying I'm in the moment. And are you cancer free today? I'm now tested every four months. The first was yes, one month, and then it's the three month test. And then it's the six months is what I'm looking forward to. But yeah, I'm in the four month, every four months for this year. And as far as I know, my doctor, of course, Dr. Laviana, talk about an optimist. He's like, Every time I get my test results, I told you, you know, you're never, it's gone, Vicki. You know, we destroyed it. It's gone. So, okay. I hope, but yes, everybody has that scanxiety as they call it. I don't care at all to go and look at my calendar and see what the date is. It's coming up in February. <laughs> I just know that. I think I still have major anxiety about bad news from a doctor, but I think the difference is... Just like I relied on, and I think everyone that has to go through this, you look at your history and you said, I made it through that. I made it through this. I made it through that. Wow. I can't believe I did that. I did 10 triathlons. But now I think when I go into these tests, I just have to say, I'm going to be accepting, obviously, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, I'm nervous going in. My blood pressure is probably super high. And then... I wait for those results. You know, they come on my phone. I see them. I go, okay, Mitch, I'm going to read them right now. I'm going to go in the office. I'm going to sit down. I don't want to be in bed reading this stuff. And I'll come in my office and I start to read through it. And I go, wow, these are good numbers. Okay. It says they don't see anything new, you know, in my lungs and other organs. And I kind of just go, whew, made it through another one. And yeah, I look forward to that day. Is there anything else you can think of that you would want to share with anybody who's facing cancer diagnosis, cancer treatment, um, worried about getting the diagnosis? The experience was you must advocate for your body and for your family. I mean, same thing. I think about my daughters and my partner and everybody. I'm like, no, you have to show up and tell them you're not going to be blown off because that's the only word I can think uh, term is being blown off because that's what it felt like. So as you have, I mean, it's a terrible journey, but as you have these tests done or whatever they're recommending, if it doesn't sound as if it's soon enough, I say, keep pushing it, get in there, go for it. Um, I, I do look back and I remember seeing my, my physician, my general practice physician in February of 2020. And he said, because I went back to him and said, why didn't you do a urine test that day? He said, you were in a hurry. And I said, I was not in a hurry. Number one, you're a doctor. You're, you know, what are you talking about? He goes, no, no, no. I don't think we did it because you said that you were in a hurry. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't like that answer. That I realized was a turning point where I could have stood up for myself and said, hey, don't you do a urine test? Isn't that part of the physical? Because that was my physical. That's why I went into the doctor that day. So I just think we all have to, no matter if you've been diagnosed or not, you must advocate for yourself. If something 
Yeah. Being too nice. Yes. I remember always thinking, I don't want to insult this. This is the doctor. You know, I can't tell them what to do, but I do believe you need to. I think stand up for yourself. If I had, um, yeah, a class on cancer, <laughs> that would be one of the first, you know, 101. Be your own advocate. Don't let them blow you off especially when you're an old lady. <laughs>